Coming to the book festival so often these past weeks in order to do these interviews, I found myself returning repeatedly to a statement that Don DeLillo makes in one of his novels. The idea that terrorists now possess the place in our consciousness once occupied by the novelist. That their actions and images have captured our collective imagination so powerfully in a way that the creations of writers once did. I've always had problems with that statement and coming to the festival this year has helped me clarify that disagreement. Terrorist acts are intended to be loud, sensational and brutal. No matter what the book, the act of reading is always a very private, intimate and secret experience. In fact, I, I don't think books and acts of terror even compete for the same place in our consciousness. No matter what the book may be, the act of reading and the way it works upon us is always a private, invisible, almost secret process. And the great contribution of an event such as this festival is to re-socialize that private experience, to remind readers of diverse books that they are not alone and that no matter how intimate and solitary the reading experience, books always emanate from and are about the world around us. Books, as much as acts of terror, embody opinions, perspectives and quarrels. But to equate their ways of working is to me a pointless confusion of categories. And judging merely by the number and variety of people who have passed through these gardens in the last fortnight, it seems to me an act of unnecessary pessimism to announce the death of the book at the hands of the terrorist. Tariq, as ordinary citizens of Western societies, would you say that we are all somehow constructed by this American fundamentalism that you describe? Well, I think we live in a world which is now dominated by the American empire. The American consensus, as it's called, dominates politics, economics, and sometimes even culture in many parts of the world. So uh, our identities are formed within that crucible, which affects everyone. And so you have a situation where people try to fight against that identity by searching for another one, whether it's uh, race or religion or gender or sexuality, just to have something else in addition to that, because there's no other broad political alternative which appears at the moment. That's the world we live in, and that's the world in which young people are growing up and being formed. And that's why I argue in Clash of Fundamentalisms and my new book, Bush in Babylon, that you have to create a generation of dissenters, people who ask questions, people who approach the system critically, people who constantly interrogate uh, the politicians in power and don't just cave in, uh, in, in, in front of them. But yeah, in, in, in short, the answer is yes. Because a lot of people here might feel that fundamentalism is perhaps an unduly provocative word to use in such a context because at least in America or Western Europe there are a large number of people who would feel that they live their daily lives without fear and can express themselves as and when they please which isn't something you usually associate with fundamentalist societies. Are you suggesting that this daily freedom is either partially an illusion or that millions of people elsewhere are paying the price in terms of their human rights for this freedom that we assume is universal? Well, I think the way you have to look at it is the following. First, the struggle for democratic rights, let's talk about those first, uh, has always been an uneven struggle. I mean, the notion that capitalism can coexist with democracy and has always done so is nonsense. In fact, in every country in the world, including in, in Britain, people had to fight really hard to win their democratic rights. You had the struggle of the Chartists, you had the struggle of the Reform Acts, and every time the people who ruled the country resisted that. So it's a constant struggle. Then in the 20th century, with the uh, eruption of revolutions in many parts of the world, 
these democratic rights, capitalism integrated them within its system and tried to convey the impression that they were part and parcel, that the two went together, that if you wanted democracy, you had to have capitalism. Uh, but they very rarely said, if you have capitalism, you have to have democracy. So in large parts of the world, they, you have capitalism, but no democracy, and that poses no problem for the United States or the West. And if you look at those countries which they've invaded in recent years, they're countries where there were few democratic rights, but where there was no capitalism in the traditional sense either. So what they go in and they pounce on them, whether it's Serbia, whether it's Iraq, now they're eyeing Burma. I'm not saying these are good regimes, but the reason the empire goes for them has nothing to do with their democracy or lack of it, but everything to do with the fact that they've pre prevented the big corporate from coming in. <clears throat> and this is um, now very noticeable in, in the world where we have a situation where, in my opinion, the, <coughs> the, 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 the onslaught, the steamroller effect of globalization, which is a polite word for capitalism, is actually affecting the functioning of democracy itself. So far from capitalism and democracy, being inextricably linked to each other, we have a situation where they are moving away from each other. And I think we're seeing the effects of that in Europe, <clears throat> in Western Europe, in the United States, where many, many young people are completely alienated from these political structures because they feel whoever you vote for, whether it's center-left or center-right, Republican or Democrat, the corporations are the ones who really rule. But because when I was going through your book, I found that one thing that was conspicuously absent was a discussion of Europe as a possible and viable oppositional entity to, to this American expansionism that you describe. Do you not believe that this is ever possible? I mean, is Europe resigned to being either a passive or, or an active, complicit partner in American expansionism? Well, the reason you didn't find it in my book is because I don't take Europe too seriously, right. either as a political entity or as an entity which is capable of challenging the American empire. It's a serious economic entity. Basically, the European Union is an economic union. Uh, it's true that people got very excited because the Germans and the French resisted the war on Iraq, and it's very good that they did that. However, it's important for people to know that once the war started, both Germany and France jumped on the bandwagon. The German foreign minister appealed to the Iraqis not to resist, and the French said now that the war's begun, we wish the United States uh, a quick victory, speedy success. So even the opposition to the war didn't last that long. And now they're all desperately negotiating behind the scenes to get part of the action. Iraqi oil and contracts. And the reason <coughs> the United States isn't letting them in is because they want to dominate all that, saying, why should you have it now when, it's been, when we needed you, you didn't come in with us. So it's a very cynical operation. And then there's another problem with Europe, which is Britain. As long as as you have Britain inside the European Union, you will not be able to develop uh, an entity that could resist the United States on its own terms. Britain will not permit that. And the whole expansion of Europe, bringing in the Eastern European states, is designed for that. Make it diverse, make it big, make it, keep it to an economic union. And I think at the moment, there's no sign that it will move beyond that. Tarek, my next question would ask you to reflect on the role of the individual writer um, in, in society. Because before the war in Iraq, for instance, there were about four million people who came together all over the world on the same day to display their opposition to the war. The UN was against the war. Yet those in power went ahead anyway and with transparent self-interest did what they were always going to do. And in the context of such an obvious imbalance of power, how does the individual writer feel that he or she can make an influential intervention in the affairs of their society?
Well, I don't think it's just up to writers. You know, I mean, writers perform one task, which is very important. They write. Uh, they don't always write the same things, and not all writers are dissenters, as you know. But I think the, the, the problem you raise about the desynchronization between the large protests against the war in Iraq and the political establishment in all these countries is an important point. And what it shows is that the opposition to the war was not reflected in the mainstream political establishment, either in Britain or the United States of America. Uh, they ignored it. Uh, the House of Commons pretty much unanimously went to war. The Senate and the House of Representatives in the United States did virtually the same. You know, the, they, they, that's what they did. And from that, the logic which flows for me is that you punish these politicians who behaved like that. And that's where people didn't do it. So the, if the two million people who had marched in London had decided, right, we are not going to vote new Labour, but we might vote Green or whatever, <coughs> that would have an effect. Uh, but they haven't done that now. I was thinking that after the war, the results to the Scottish uh, uh, Parliament would reflect that opposition, because a large bulk of Scotland was opposed to the war. But when it came to voting, people went and voted Labour, or they didn't vote. There was no big switch to the opposition, because both the SNP and the Scottish Socialists were opposed to the war. And if the people of Scotland had elected an anti-war parliament here, it would have had a big effect in, in Britain as a whole, but they didn't do it. So that also is a desynchronization, seeing the protests as one-off things and not linking them to the rest of society. Tariq, I'd love to continue in this vein, but my next question is going to take you to a completely different area of the book, because a large section of your book is devoted to a discussion of South Asia, mm. and I was just wondering where you saw South Asian affairs going in, say, the next five or ten years. I'm thinking of Pakistan, Kashmir, India. Look, m I've been arguing for a long time now that the only hope in that region is for the creation of a South Asian Union, modeled partially on the European Union, where countries remain, retain their sovereignties, but work together uh, economically, regionally, help each other. You see, if they don't do that, they're completely dependent on third parties. Why should India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the three big countries in that region, and you could add to them Sri Lanka, Nepal, that makes it five countries, why should they not collaborate, cooperate, do things for their people, collaborate economically, create schools, hospitals, and education system, cut down defense spending by 50%, which could transform that region. It could easily happen. And it's in the interests of that world for it to happen. And I, you know, I don't want to be ultra dramatic, but the choice is either that or blowing each other up in the long term. And I think many people are now beginning to to understand this. And why should we talk, to India talk to Pakistan or Pakistan to India mediated by the United States? We are neighboring countries, we can just do it. So I think that in the, in the medium and long term that is the only serious solution to the problems of that region, working together. Tariq, my last question is, is to, would ask you to reflect on your relationship with Islam because You've, over the years, in many different places and contexts, you've insisted that you're not, in any conventional sense, a Muslim. Yet this book is suffused with discussions of diverse Islamic heritages and histories. I wanted to ask you if, especially in the context of contemporary events and discourses, do you feel any particular connection or obligation to representing these histories in the West? Well, I've no, I've, if you, if you read my book carefully, what I say is I'm not a believer. I'm an atheist, but I've grown up in an Islamic culture. Uh, and it's like many Jewish people or Christians who are atheists, but grow up in cultures dominated by, you know, Judaic thought or Chris, Christian 
art or whatever, and it becomes part of their culture. And the same has happened to me as far as Islam. I'm sort of, uh, you know, suffused with this culture. It's, it goes very deep in me and I know it well. And what I'm trying to show through that book that you can still be that without being a believer. You don't have to be deeply religious to appreciate the finer points of Islamic culture or any other culture for that matter. It's not necessary to be a hardcore believer. So I'm trying to detach the culture and history of Islam from religion or even from religious fundamentalism. Right. There's so much ignorance now uh, about uh, Islam, its culture, its history, its development, the debates which took place in it historically, what happened to it in Europe. I mean, how many people in the United States, if you were to ask them, how long was Islam in Portugal and Spain, what the countries in the Iberian Peninsula? I'm prepared to bet you that minus or point zero 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 nine percent would be able to tell you the the real answer to that is 400 years how were they chucked out so all these things I think are quite important and um, I think they are seen as such in the Islamic world where there is a deep sense of history Tariq, I'd like to thank you for an extraordinarily vivid, substantial and provocative discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Tell us a bit about the global justice movement. Well, at the moment what we call the global justice movement is pretty loose and diffuse. It's a movement of movements really, a, um, a coalition of groups which stand more or less for the same thing most of the time. Um, it's not a fixed movement with a membership or anything like that, of course. But what we see is tens of millions of people becoming involved in this, perhaps the biggest political movement the world has ever seen, becoming involved in exactly the same thing, which is contesting the power of the IMF and the World Bank, of the UN Security Council, of George Bush and the people who surround him. In other words, contesting the dictatorship which runs the world, over whom the people of the world have no say, no power at all, they're completely unaccountable, completely unrepresentative, unre and calling in its place for a world order which reflects the needs of human beings, which right. is run by the people right. and for the people. Uh, now, to what extent we can say that this movement is a coherent entity which is ready to start implementing that, that's another question, but that there is a huge movement and a powerful movement is undeniable. And its diverse strands are somewhat aware of each other? Yes, yes. Right. I mean, this is one of the great paradoxes that we come across. It's because of economic globalization that we are so much yeah. better coordinated than we'd otherwise be, because right. it's created all these great communications networks and transport networks and the rest of it, which allows us to talk to each other. Precisely right. the sort of thing that you are doing right. permits us to talk to each other. Right. And of course, the technology that you are using the, uh, uh, and the internet and all the rest of it is created right. by the very forces that we're contesting. Right. It's a, a fascinating process. The, the internet is developed by the Pentagon to wage war. We use it to try and prevent war. Yeah. And, and that in itself is a very revolutionary development. If you think of some of the, the, the revolutionary movements in the past, which tried to rise in a concerted fashion, but because they didn't know what each other were doing, one lot would come up and get knocked down, the other lot would come up and get knocked down, and, yeah. and, and they couldn't coordinate it. Yeah. And unless you can coordinate your actions, you haven't a hope of yeah. those actions being effective. Yeah. That leads very well into my, into my next question about who would be responsible for spreading awareness of such a movement. Would there be a vanguard of leaders in each nation state and how, how would they raise the resources to, to organize themselves and how would they accrue legitimacy to themselves, credibility? As far as creating something like a world parliament? Or, or, or even awareness, working towards it in each individual nation state? Well, well this of course is already happening and, and we see in just about every nation on earth, I haven't come across a nation in which it's not happening, um, people spontaneously organising, learning lessons from other people, being inspired by other people. Look at how the Zapatistas have inspired people all over the world. Um, and, and, and in turn, going on to inspire other people. Now, 
of course this is a self-appointed movement. Ultimately all movements are. People are outraged by something, they respond to it, and they appoint themselves to try and do something about it and encourage other people to do something about it. That's the way all politics works. What we also need to see, though, I feel, alongside that, is a formal representational structure so that um, the people of the world can actually be represented properly, that they can know that it's their interest rather than the self-interest of particular activists right. which is being represented. And this is why I feel we need a directly elected world parliament. Right. And where would the money come from? But one of the other ideas that I've um, been developing in my book is um, a revival of John Maynard Keynes's yes. brilliant idea yes. for what he called an international clearing union, which is uh, basically a way of ensuring that countries don't get deeply into debt, that their trade deficits don't accumulate so that they turn into this crippling permanent debt that we've seen at the moment. Now, he first proposed this idea in 1943. Yeah. It was crushed by the Americans. They instead imposed the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund on the world, and we all know what happened. In fact, at the time, people were saying these programs will be a complete disaster. They'll end up with massive indebtedness for the poor countries, massive power for the rich countries, and, well, they've been vindicated. Um, uh, but one of the many advantages of, of Keynes's system is that it has something called a reserve fund, uh, which is composed of all the, 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 uh, all, all the interest placed on trade deficits and trade surpluses within this bank called the International Clearing Union. And that would amount to many tens of billions of dollars every year. Not only could it easily fund a world parliament and global elections and all the rest of it, but it could also fund so many of the desperately required health programs and educational programs um, and, um, and, and all the other um, desperately needed projects which, which help people to get out of the terrible poverty that they're in. Yeah. George, but would, would state and corporate machineries even allow such radical dissemination to take place? I mean, things on a much smaller uh, scale are crushed so mercilessly all around the world. Tell us about how you see both the, the, the time frame that we would need to, to A, either persuade the powerful that their time is up or, or dismantle or overthrow them altogether. I, I think we have to have cruel and unusual measures um, um, which, which effectively force the powerful um, to do what we want because they're not going to volunteer to sacrifice their power. They're not going to no. volunteer to step back and give it to us. That just doesn't happen in history. That's, that's, that's a lesson we can, we can draw very clearly. Um, uh, but I've suggested such measures in the book and one of them um, is this extraordinary power which lies in the hands of the poor world but which the poor world has never really seen because it's always been bamboozled into seeing the global economy from the perspective of the rich people. And, um, and, and this great power they have lies in the form of their debt. I know this sounds very weird, because we always are used to seeing debt as, an a, as a liability rather than an asset, but you know how it's often said that if you owe the bank a thousand dollars, you're in trouble, and if you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank <coughs> is in trouble. Bank. Well, what if you owe the bank 2.2 trillion dollars? What if collectively you own the, global, uh, the, the whole global financial system? And that's what the poor nations do. They need to get together, and they desperately need to get together for many reasons, but they need to get together and collectivize this debt and say, we will collectively renege on that debt unless we get the following concessions. And, um, and, and that puts them in a tremendous position of power because, of course, the people who uh, get frightened by this are the very people among whom fear works most effectively, which is the financial markets. Yeah and they are effectively forced to turn to their own governments and say, for God's sake, give these people what they want, or we're finished, yeah. we're ruined. Uh, but you've got to use those sort of big stick methods, otherwise we get nowhere. Well, I wanted to ask about how, on an individual level or on a small scale level, is how you see the role of, say, civil disobedience sort of movements, as opposed to the place of violence. I mean, would, would violence be either inevitable or... or um, understandable in any instance? Well, it's my hope. Especially and when state violence would probably be unleashed on a massive scale to repress. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it's my hope, and you might think this is a naive hope, that we can do these things without violence. In fact, I feel we have to do these things without violence. Uh, the moment you engage in violence, you're effectively playing to the strengths 
of your opponents. We know how much violence governments have at their disposal. They've got entire armies, they've got every kind of weapon you could ever imagine. We don't possess these things. And to become involved in violent confrontation with them is, is, is to be in a situation in which we are very much at a disadvantage. And quite aside from that, of course, there's a the moral issue, there's the issue of the image that you create for yourselves and the alienation, the alienation of non-violent people caused by that. And I, I feel for those reasons, anything we do has to be done non-violently. Uh, but civil, disobe civil disobedience plays an enormous role in it. We have to cause trouble. Uh, without trouble, all political systems sclerotize and succumb to corruption. Trouble is the only thing which preserves democracy. And, and, and it's, it's, it's the, the, the critical factor which, which makes democracy possible. One of the reasons why our own democracy in countries like Britain has, has become so rotten is that we haven't held it to account. We haven't embarrassed it enough. We haven't exposed it enough. And, and that's what we have to do, not just at the national level, but also at the global level. Last couple of questions, one of which will take playing the devil's advocate slightly further. Um, I can't help thinking of just before the 1914 war, how communists across Europe thought that the working classes everywhere would recognize their common interest and refuse to fight. And sometimes it seems to me that among the left, the, the idea of the people becomes some kind of abstract piety, almost an article of faith, that there is some inherent decency in people that can always be appealed to. But surely there, there's also the fact that there are millions of not just ruling class people, but working people who believe in the rightness of things as they are, or even the inevitability of things as they are, just as there are millions of working class racists, nationalists. How would they be persuaded of their best interests? Sure, well, well, I, I, it's very clear to me that the political circumstances in which we live are now quite different to those of, the, of 1914. Yes. Yes. Nationalism is a much weaker force, again paradoxically because of economic globalization. It pulls down the borders, the boundaries between ourselves and other people, the political ones, the economic ones, the cultural ones, the linguistic ones, and it forces us to see that we have a universal class interest because we've got the very same institutions, the very same corporations doing people in, in all corners of the world. Yes. Um, that, 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 that's the sort of the, 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 the broad background to to the circumstances we're in. Um, but, of course, the, the same factors of people um, pursuing self-interest, people not seeing the wider picture, are, are always going to be there. But one of the things that the current system does is to reduce so many people to a state of desperation that it becomes clear to them that the existing system cannot be sustained, or their lives cannot be sustained within it and that something has to change. People sometimes say to me, well, how realistic are your ideas? And I say, well, how realistic is the idea that we can carry on as we are, that we can carry on with a system which impoverishes desperately half the world's people, in which 800 million people are in a permanent state of starvation, in which we are slowly cooking the planet through climate change to such an extent that human life becomes virtually impossible within 100 years. That system is impossible. It is totally unrealistic that we can sustain it. And, and the further that system goes, the more people see that that's the case and see that something has to snap. Last question is, there's a pa passage in your book that I found particularly interesting in which you ask um, first world activists to examine their own prejudices and suspicions when it actually comes to dev devolving power to the rest of the world. And I wanted to ask, in your experience of worldwide forum, like the so, how how do activists from such diverse conditions and backgrounds, such as the first and the third worlds, when they get together, what kind of exchange takes place? Well, one of the things I've noticed in general with this movement is that it's very much led psychologically, philosophically, by the poor world rather than by the rich world. I mean, for a start. The, the, the vast majority of people in this movement are in countries like Mexico, Brazil, India, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Thailand, South Africa, countries like that. And, and our numbers are much smaller by comparison. Um, and, and it seems to me, and I hope this isn't just uh, wishful thinking, but it seems to me that there is a, a great deal of respect shown by the people from the rich world to, towards the people of, of, of the poor world. There's this sense that they are the moral leaders of this movement and we take our lead from them.
And I hope that continues to be the case. It desperately needs to continue to be the case. And I find it very exciting that um, some of the most inspiring figures in the movement um, or groups in the movement are, are the ones which have been generated in places like Mexico and Brazil and indeed South Africa. And, and, and so there's um, a, a great deal of hope, I think, of reversing this sense that we in the rich world have something to teach those people in the poor world. It now seems to be more the other way around. Right. George, I'd like to thank you for an extremely substantial discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Raj. William, um, reading your book, one thing I was constantly reminded of was Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where it's... <laughs> it, was that, it was that cheery, was it? <laughs> no, it's because in that book, it's the apparent savagery and darkness implicit in Africa that brings out the monster in Kurtz. But, in, but in, your, in your conception of white Mughals, India has very different effects on the Europeans who arrived there. Yes, I mean, it's, it's the reverse of Heart of Darkness rather than Heart of Darkness. The Heart of Darkness, in a sense, is the paradigm of, of, of the classic view of colonialism, quite rightly as being one that's basically an exploitative relationship whereupon white Europeans go out to the third world, plunder its its resources, enslave its people, shell the jungle and then disappear back to London and retire in Cheltenham or in Edinburgh. You know. This is the untold early half of that story and while in no way wishing to whitewash colonialism in any way, it does tell about an utterly different relationship that existed in the immediate pre-colonial period. Particularly with India, I think the problem is that you have this obsession in Britain with the Raj the Raj actually lasted only 90 years, which in, in the span of Indian history is a blink in the eye. The Raj lasted from 1857 to 1947. The British, though, were in India from the time of Shakespeare. And the relationships that you get um, between the British and the Indians and the power relationships that you get in the period preceding the Raj, if you like, the period that is the, the base of the iceberg, the three quarters of the length of the time the British were in India is very different. First and foremost, and most clearly, if you look, for example, in the 1780s, you find that one in three British men is married to or is living with Indian women. Now, some of this is straightforward slave-master relationship, concubinage, colonial exploitation, as you'd find, say, in the West Indies. But if you actually look at the detail of the wills, an amazing number, a surprising number, and in fact, a redeeming number, are genuine, Love, right. love relationships between equal people and the men are writing in their wills as indeed the women are writing in their wills although they're less frequent um, you know I leave everything to my beloved Karen Nisa who's been with me 100 years 50 years since I arrived in, as, as a young 18 year old in Delhi she's never left my side everything I have my gardens my hackeries my jewels my slaves I leave to her and you find this over and over again and for those of us you know who are all brought up on this image of the colonial period as being one of unbroken exploitation, as being an unbroken imposition of Western culture on the East, an unbroken um, story of, of, of whites going out, making money out of the third world, coming home again. This is not, not only surprising, it's actually a little it's bit refreshing. Challenged. Yeah. It's challenging. Yeah. Because here you have, of course, a different power relationship. In the pre-colonial period, the Brits are not the masters. Yeah. They're not sitting dictating. Yeah. Uh, and, and saying our culture is best. Yeah. They come to India because India is so frigging rich. Um, they don't go there because you know, they're, doing, they're, they're working for UNICEF or, yeah. or Save the Children Fund. Yeah. They're, they're there to make money in what, it's rather like, I suppose the kind of nearest equivalent would be the um, Eastern Europeans going to New York today, selling shoddy Russian-made leather jackets on the street corners of Manhattan. And this is what the early Brits were like. They went there because the Mughal Empire was the richest place on earth. They made the most fabulous textiles. It had all the diamonds in the world. It had two harvests a year. India was a land of untold riches. So you've got to shed all the baggage we have about, you know, give Sita 50 pounds and save her sight. Yeah. You've got to shed all the baggage of Kipling and the power relationships of the Raj <coughs> and go back to a completely different world, a forgotten world, where the Indians were the cultural superiors and the British were kind of rough, tough northerners wanting in on the act. Yeah. And in that situation, of course, you get different power relationships. Yeah. So the British are attracted to Indian women, they want to marry, they dress themselves in Indian clothes, 
and and you know it's it's an interesting period. But you find large numbers of Brits, for example, converting to Islam. Yeah. And at a time when we're told that there's this clash of civilizations, it's very refreshing to discover that huge numbers of Brits are actually Muslim. Yeah. You know, how strange that's, is that? <laughs> your work shows up identity to be a much more fluid, complex, and multiple matter. What's interesting is, is, in a sense, it challenges not just the obvious Huntingdon, Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, this sort of pathetic American idea that you know Christianity is with us, God is with us, these sand niggers, as they now call Arabs in America, are, are subhuman, have to be, have to be tamed and, 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 and subdued. It doesn't just, in a sense, challenge that. It also challenges, perhaps more interestingly, the, the kind of conception of, of, of uh, for example, Saeed, who sees, again, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the third world, othering the, the, the subdued colonial nations. At this period, which is, in a sense, the as I say, the, in terms of time, is, is the longer period of the yeah. colonial, in colonial history. Yeah. You have a, a, the opposite thing. You have poor Westerners going out to the rich and cultured East and, and, and wanting to be part of it, yeah. wanting in on the act. Yeah. They want a green card, you yeah. know. They <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and in your work, like the gateway for Europeans to discover and then open themselves up to India moves from falling in love with a woman to falling in love with aspects of its language, its literature, its music, religion. I wanted to ask, what was your gateway from the Firth of Fourth to this extended involvement with India? I, you know, ultimately when you're talking about a love affair, you can analyze it, but ultimately it's an emotional thing. You can't sort of pin your finger on it. And I, obviously I have thought about this, why, why India and why does it have this effect? I had, a, I had a particularly sheltered, unbelievable childhood. Grew up in North Berwick. We used to take our holidays in Mull and Gearloch. Other kids at school, um, you know, were going off to Paris and, and Italy and seeing the world. And I never did. I mean, and so, when through quite a series of accidents, I ended up going with a friend teaching a school in, in India. It had, I think, a far more dramatic effect than it would have had on a more cosmopolitan kid. You know, if you'd already been and seen half of Europe and, uh, you know, were a jaded cosmopolitan traveller, going to India is just another country to tick off on your list. Yeah. If, by contrast, you know, you've never been anywhere uh, and, uh, and suddenly you arrive in Delhi. It blows your mind. Uh, you know, it blows your mind. <laughs> and, and it did blow my mind. It, it had a completely explosive effect in a very positive way. Yeah. You know, it, it, it did. It's a cliche about things changing your life, but this it very literally did. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no way around that. I, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now, but yeah. for that trip, aged 18. 20 years ago, next year. Wow. Um, aged, yes, an 18 year old. Extended tw involvement in 26th the... of January 1984. I wow. touched up in Delhi for the first time. How much of your research, especially in an Indian environment, is exclusively library and archive based? And how much do you use or draw upon? You know, gossip, rumor, legend that you've picked up on in people's homes or on the streets. All my previous books have been the latter: right. um, nine tenths gossip and conversation, and 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 one tenth archive research. This book, I suppose, is the reverse. It's a history book. Right. Um, I mean, it's pure and simple. It's a social history. Uh, so it involved five years of going to libraries in in Delhi, Hyderabad, and and particularly the British Library in London. Right. Um, with the history book, I mean, it, it, there's a tension at the heart of White Moogles, which in a sense, uh, on one hand, I'm, I'm trying to write a social history which is trying to change our conception of, of, of what the early colonial period was about. On the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell a kind of bodice-ripping, sari-ripping romance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sh sure that I've necessarily married the two as successfully as I could have done. I think it should probably be a bit shorter, maybe 100 pages shorter than it actually was. but. You, 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 nonetheless, you, it, is a, it is a serious, it attempts to be a serious work of history and it, every, you know, sentence is footnoted. Right. And, uh, and so it, naturally you are dependent first and foremost on yeah. um, I think that's one on, of the most archive research. successful things about the book, that it, it manages to stitch together so many diverse accounts and, and yet be so compelling. And, and I wanted to ask, how did you... It could be tighter. I, it's only one of my books, although 
it's sold much better than any of my previous books and it's won more awards and it's been more fated than any of my previous books. It's the only book which I've written which I would substantially rewrite if I had the chance. I right. do think it's too long. Right. Um, it's nearly 600 pages and it should be not a page more than 500 pages. Right. Um, I'd cut a full fifth of it if I had the chance right. now. I wanted to ask about how you felt about Kairon Nissa's voice. Did you ever feel you were hearing her? Because she's always reported upon. It, you know, the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that it, it has reclaimed an entire area, physically, geographically, the Deccan, and an entire period, the early colonial period, and an entire set of power relationships which ha have been obscured. What it never successfully does is you cannot, because it's non-fiction, resurrect a yeah. woman whose voice was never it was is, is is destroyed she wrote she was extremely literate she wrote letters regularly but they were destroyed um they i think i suspect those she let, she wrote to kirkpatrick were lost but those she wrote russell were deliberately um destroyed by his niece i think um clearly there there, there, there if you go through his archive there there's been a, a weeding out not only of her letters but of references to her right um and she is the central character more so even than kirkpatrick and there is a hole in the book, which is her voice. We have her speech reported by her husband, her lover, her mother, her servants, but we never actually hear her directly, not one word. There is, all there is is a, um, there is a set of, um, a poem that she almost certainly wrote, basically saying what a hunky guy her husband is. It's a, it's, it's a love poem. Um, and that's it. Right. And even that is not 100% certainly her. Right. William, so I, you can't do anything about it, but yeah. <laughs> you do best. I'd like to end by asking you something about, you, you've brought up already in, in, in this contemporary atmosphere of where the rhetoric is all about the clash of civilizations. Your work portrays those conflicts, but also brings out the human capacity for synthesis and openness. And do you see such work as especially relevant in these times? As a reminder? Well, the, I mean, that wasn't why I wrote the book, but no doubt. I mean, since September 11th, it suddenly, you know, when I started writing this, it was a charming love story, but was about as relevant as Dad's army. You know, now, quite suddenly, when we had this Islamophobia, this, this doctrine of clash of civilization fed down our throat, less so here than in America. If you go to the States, turn on Fox TV, and you've got these kind of raving evangelical crazies denouncing Islam, talking about it as the religion of the devil. You know, this sort of bollocks. Same um, in India. The same in India. You have, the, you have exactly the BJP. Yeah. It's completely clear to me, in a completely unpropagandist way, that much that's great about civilization, almost anywhere that you choose to point your finger, comes from not the clash of civilization, but the fusion of civilizations. When two different cultures come into contact, there is conflict at times, but equally it's those moments when you know, suddenly something amazing happens. Mughal civilization being an example. You have, you know, this new force coming from Central Asia, Muslim, um, Middle Eastern in culture, ordered, Persian. meeting, Persian, Persianate, meeting the kind of wild chaos, the fecund, fertile chaos of, of Indian Hinduism in all its myriad of forms. And the result is, you know, Mughal miniatures. Yeah the Urdu language, yeah. the Taj Mahal, yeah. Indian cooking, yeah. Hindustani music. I mean, it doesn't get better. Yeah. You know, you have in that, in the white heat of that mixture, yeah. you have all that is greatest about Indian civilization, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Certainly much that is greatest, yeah. you know, without any question. Yeah. And, and it is, you know, if you look again at, sort of, I suppose, Byzantium, you know, in, in the Middle East, yeah. the greatest civilization of medieval Christendom. It's, on one side, you've got Slavs, Lombards, yeah. you've got the Armenians, Jews, Arabs, all mixing in the streets. And fabulous churches, yeah. amazing churches. But the rest of the world is in some darkness, yeah. the dark ages. This is, this is where it's happening. It is where civilization... Manhattan today, I mean, ironically, America, you know, which, which is leading this sort of Islamophobic crusade, is a place where you see more clearly than anywhere today, really, the, the, beauty. the, the benefits of, of, yeah. of, of, of going to Manhattan. There are yeah. a million different ethnicities, yeah. different languages, different people, all performing, you know, Koreans, yeah. Indians, Brits, Italians, yeah. Jews, all mixing together. And the result is, is fizz, effervescence. It's not yeah. clash of civilization. You don't have gang warfare in Manhattan today. You have the most culturally interesting place in the world. Yeah. And in a sense, you've got to see that. Yeah.
Mm. So I, think, I do. I think it's very. I think. I think suddenly it is sadly terribly yeah. relevant. And I think India needs as much reminding of that as America does. Sure. Absolutely. William, I'd like to thank you for an extraordinarily vivid and, and engaging response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good luck.